Okay, this is LLSA 2021 for Emergency Medicine. The article is a review article, Diverticulitis by Young Farak, and Salim is going to walk us through this. Salim, this is something I see very often, but you're going to have some new information, I'm sure, for me in terms of how should I be working this up and diagnosing it and treating it, the nuances. Yeah, this was a great review article. And, you know, every time I think I know what I'm doing, I read a paper like this and then I pick up some new pearls that I maybe learned at some point and just kind of forgot along the way. And, and I think you're going to get a bunch of those out of this paper. So the first thing is, let's start with, you know, diverticular disease is a, it's truly it's a spectrum. And it starts as low as diverticulosis. It can be acute, uncomplicated diverticulitis, and then it can become complicated diverticulitis. And that's kind of the spectrum we're looking at here. Uh, for complicated diverticulitis, it's things that you would think about. Abscess formation, fistula formation, stricture formation, perforation, peritoneal signs like peritonitis um, would all make things kind of complicated. Now. Uh, the author, she goes through and says that the pathophysiology of diverticular disease is not entirely known. It could be due to altered gut motility and maybe some alterations in intraluminal pressures, but it's, it's just not really been flushed out very well. Now, here's the good news. There's two societies that have guidelines on the management of diverticulitis, and they are the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons, as well as the American Gastroenterological Association. This is the good news part of it. The recommendations in this review, they're all consistent with both sets of guidelines and both guidelines essentially agree with each other. So they got rid of a lot of the nuance and which one do we go with? Everyone seems to agree, the review article as well as the two sets of guidelines. Yeah, it really builds a partnership between us and our surgeons. And I love that part when you've got a review article and I believe the author, she is actually a colorectal surgeon. But now, I, instead of it being like a butting heads or, no, we do this, you do that, it's just like, hey, this is what we do. These are your guidelines. And so I'm very appreciative of that. Yeah, it's always nice when they when they happen to, to agree with each other. Yeah. Now, I'm going to give her some kudos here because she's talking about the prevalence of diverticulosis and how it's increased. And she goes back and looks at cases from the 1900s. And she says diverticulosis at that time was two to 10%. And now uh, in, in this paper, it's 2000 to 2007, there's been a 50% increase in patients over the age of 60. So quite the jump. And then no surprise, if you have an increase in diverticulosis, well, you're gonna see an increase in diverticulitis. And so during that same time frame, there was a 60% increase in diverticulitis. Now, what I don't know is, is it because we have CAT scans now and they didn't have CAT scans back in the 1900s and that's why we're not you know, seeing as many cases back then? Or is it that no, it's because the prevalence of diverticulosis has increased so much, so has the incidence and prevalence of diverticulitis? Unclear from this review paper, but nonetheless, it's something we're all gonna see. Then she goes through and talks about some of the risk factors for diverticulitis. She says these include smoking, use of NSAIDs, physical inactivity, and obesity. And again, in the U.S., we have no shortage of physical inactivity and obesity. Now, the, the traditional typical presentation will be fever, pain in the left lower quadrant, and leukocytosis. You certainly don't have to have the complete triad. I think there's a component of clinical suspicion here. And then she goes on to say that the preferred diagnostic test is CT with IV and luminal contrast. And if you do this study, it has a sensitivity of 98% and a specificity of 99%. Now, Matt, I don't know about you, but I'm not really doing CTs with luminal contrast, despite what this review says. We're just simply using the IV contrast because it's just so dang good at identifying these patients. Well, Salim, that's exactly what's going on in my shop. I can't remember the last time I did PO contrast. And while I don't have numbers on the sensitivity and specificity of just IV contrast, I know that it's pretty darn good. And my surgeons agree with that. They're not asking for that anymore. And really, when I think about CT, it's become the cornerstone of this diagnosis. While I'm not CTing everyone with left lower quadrant, I'm going to be thinking about my differential diagnosis. When I suspect diverticulitis, 
the CT is what's going to make the diagnosis for me, especially when I'm trying to differentiate between the complicated and the uncomplicated, right? I, I, don't, I can't diagnose a fistula, abscess, and all the other things that really differentiate these patients and will drive the management. So CT, again, has become a cornerstone. Yeah. And, you know, to take it even one step further, I mean, the surgeons also need it to kind of plan their their attack in terms of how they're going to manage this. They, they need to know where, where it is, how big of an abscess are we talking about, what other type of complication. And then the other thing is, is that CT can also rule out other diagnoses. Like we may think diverticulitis in terms of our differential, but there's certainly other things that can cause pain down in the left lower quadrant. And so I think CT has really become kind of a cornerstone for these patients and is helpful to the surgeons. And most of the time, they, they want the CT so that they can make sure that they know what exactly they're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, if a patient has an acute abdomen with signs of perforation on the CT, then the patient needs surgical assessment. I think most of us understand that and agree with that. Um, the author, she basically breaks this down into emergent versus urgent. So obviously, if the patient is septic or they have peritonitis, then they need emergency surgery according to the review. Urgent surgery is indicated if they're failing to improve with medical management or even percutaneous drainage, which we'll get into a little bit later on. Now, emergency surgical techniques, they usually include laparoscopic versus open sigmoid resection. Um, both are performed, but there's some nuance here that's I think important to understand. We're clearly not gonna be making this decision. There will be a surgeon talking to the patient about this, but a resection and a primary anastomosis with loop ileostomy um, or resection and end colostomy known as a Hartman's procedure, if my medical memory serves me right, are the two other surgical techniques. Now, what's important about this is that 14 to 20% of patients admitted for diverticulitis will undergo emergent or urgent surgery during their hospitalization. So again, not an insignificant number. And almost half of these are gonna receive a colostomy and 30% of those colostomies are gonna remain permanent. Whereas the loop ileostomy is more likely to be reversed. Again, not a conversation we're having in the emergency department, but just good to know the numbers. Now, some basics about uncomplicated diverticulitis. Let's start with that, because that's probably the easiest. It's gonna account for 75% of your cases. So by far and away, this is gonna be the most common presentation. And most of them can actually be managed as an outpatient. Now, this part is kind of interesting, and this was one of those little nuggets I kind of picked up from this. So RCTs have failed to show a benefit of IV over PO antibiotics. So starting them on IV and transitioning them to PO or just starting them on PO, no difference. RCTs haven't shown any significant difference. So that's one important thing to keep in mind. But the one that I found really interesting was that Trials haven't shown any benefit to antibiotics versus no antibiotics uh, in uncomplicated diverticulitis. And I think that there is some evidence to support this. My take on this is that the studies aren't what I would call high quality. The numbers are too small and there's too many other kind of biases within those trials to say that this is ready for prime time. I think at least in the US right now, the standard care is if you diagnose uncomplicated diverticulitis, you're going to give your patient antibiotics. I think the bigger pearl or message I took away is that it just doesn't necessarily have to be IV. It can actually be just starting them on PO. Yeah, that's a tough one, Salim, because I have never uh, had a surgeon not start on my antibiotics. And I personally have never not done some form of antibiotics for diverticulitis. I, that, I didn't even know that no antibiotics was being looked at and maybe, you know, maybe something of the future. So I'll be looking out for those studies. Yeah, I don't think that's ready for prime time for sure, but just be on the lookout, kind of cutting edge. But I think most of us, and I'm with you, are using antibiotics. Um, she goes on to talk about what we do with their diet. She recommends starting with a clear liquid diet and then advancing to a kind of a lower residue diet. But... Um, she says that there's really like no good evidence for this. So that's kind of like expert opinion, if you will. There's just no RCT saying, well, we should do this over that. But it's usually as their pain tolerates, you can advance their diet. Now, Matt, this was the second pearl that I took away from this paper. And I may have learned this at some point, 
but it's not something that was on my radar. And that's that we can use monotherapy to treat diverticulitis with amoxicillin clavulinate, uh, 875 milligrams twice a day for seven to 10 days. It's a reasonable outpatient option. Now, typically I've used ciprofloxacin with metronidazole as my go-to regimen. Um, I don't know why this fell off my radar, but super important pearl because it may improve compliance for the patient. And I like this pearl because I'll tag it back into when I'm differentiating that patient, right? The uncomplicated patient, like I'm happy to send people home. And so this is like they're saying a great option for those patients. Like, look, I'm not admitting you, you're not complicated and we're going to send you home. And this is going to be the one shot antibiotic with some good return precautions. Now, here's the indications for admitting uncomplicated diverticulitis. Again, I think these all make intuitive sense. It's not a list you have to memorize. If you have a fever of greater than 101.5, and I actually would argue if you have a fever of 100.4 or higher um, with leukocytosis, by definition, you meet sepsis criteria. I don't think anybody's sending a septic patient home with oral antibiotics. So I think that just makes intuitive sense. If they're immunosuppressed or immunocompromised, Clearly, their immune system isn't going to fight off infection as well, and they probably need to be watched a little bit closer. Those patients are coming in. Serious coexisting conditions. So people who have diabetes, right, or um, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease, these patients tend not to heal as well. And so they probably are worth bringing in and watching them a little bit closer. Lack of home support, I think, is important. Uh, I think this is one that we oftentimes forget to ask is like, you know, can you perform your activities of daily living or do you need somebody at home to help you? Um, and if they need help and they don't have that help, that might be an indication for admission. Obviously, if their pain is um, out of control where they're requiring multiple doses of opioids, that's going to be hard to kind of treat at home. And so they're probably going to need to come in for that pain control. And then obviously any intractable nausea, vomiting where they can't keep themselves hydrated or much less keep their antibiotics down. These are all the reasons we'd bring these people in. So again, it's a pretty intuitive list. I don't think it's one that needs to be memorized. And again, this is one of the pitfalls brought up in the review article. Inpatient management is indicated for patients who have high fever and leukocytosis. I would even remove the high and just say fever plus leukocytosis because that just meets sepsis criteria. Now, Matt, this is the third pearl I picked up from this paper and one that um, I didn't realize was even a thing. And maybe I did at some point, but I, I didn't until I, I read this paper. First thing I want to say is that non-surgical management for abscesses is effective in about 30 to 50 percent of cases. It just depends which study you look at, but it's, it's a pretty decent number. Now I understand why my surgeons order these perk drains so frequently. But what I didn't realize is this hard cutoff of how we manage these abscesses. So if the abscess is three to four centimeters, the recommendation is antibiotics. And if the abscess is five centimeters or greater, then they re recommend the percutaneous drain. Now, how we came to this number, like what's the difference between 4.9 versus five? I don't know that there's really hard evidence for that, but I suspect from getting the drain in the right place, I do suspect that there is a size component in terms of increasing that success. I just don't know how well evidenced these numbers are, but that's what's actually recommended. In reality, these are good because now I understand my conversation with the surgeons, but I'm still having the conversation with them whether or not they have a small or less than four centimeter abscess versus a big one because they're gonna be helping guide that and they're ultimately gonna be the follow-up for this patient. And so I, again, it goes back to the, I like having the understanding of where the specialty is coming from in terms of their management, but it doesn't negate the fact that I'm gonna be making this decision. Exactly. And then the final thing um, that the author mentions in this paper is, you know, who needs a colonoscopy and when do they need it? And so the recommendation is, for uncomplicated diverticulitis, colonoscopy six to eight weeks after resolution of the diverticulitis, it's only needed if the last colonoscopy has been done more than two to three years ago. So something to put in discharge paperwork in these patients that we're sending home is that at some point they need to follow up for that colonoscopy if they've not had one in the last two or three years. Okay, elective surgery. So this this gets a little bit more nuanced, and I, I think it's good for our understanding of you know what the surgeons are thinking. 
So certainly elective surgery is an option for recurrent uncomplicated diverticulitis. Only three to 5% of patients have complicated recurrence after uncomplicated diverticulitis. So that number is not that high. And the author goes on to say that patients who underwent segmental surgical resection for recurrent diverticulitis, they can have additional episodes of diverticulitis at a rate of 5%. But the good news is, is that once you've had surgery, the chances that you would need repeat surgery go down to 0.4% uh, in these patients. So not something that's commonly done uh, for this disease process. And, you know, I always remember reading somewhere along the way that you know, the number of episodes and a period of time or the indication to actually get the surgery. And it turns out that current guidelines state that decisions regarding elective surgery aren't driven by the number of episodes, but should be done on an individual basis, looking at not only the frequency of the attacks, but coexisting conditions, patient preference and quality of life. So it seems like guidelines don't look at a hard number of like, oh, if you've had three cases of this in the last six months, then you need to have part of your, your colon taken out. It's more of an individualized kind of look at this. So it's just a good thing to know in terms of what our surgeons are thinking. All right, so now there's some areas of uncertainty and I was surprised how many there are for diverticulitis, something that we see all the time, something we treat all the time, really lots of things. So like, do we actually need to use antibiotics for uncomplicated diverticulitis? I think, you know, in the paper, they say that there's a lot of controversy on this. And I think that we still need more evidence before we take up that practice. The use of percutaneous drainage, well, if it works for abscesses that are five centimeters or greater, Maybe we can drop that number down to maybe three to five centimeters. Maybe that's possible, um, but we would need further evidence for that. Again, the pathogenesis of this illness, it's really not well understood. I think understanding the barriers to laparoscopic surgery, which by the way, is the preferred option here um, over open for elective surgeries. Um, I think this is something important that needs to be studied because obviously the smaller the incisions um, and the better we are at the techniques, uh, the less complications for the patients, but we just need more information on that. And then I think the paper brings up some really interesting uh, things. And this was kind of the fourth little nugget I picked up was alternatives to surgery. So people who are high risk for surgery, um, maybe some other options are the use of rifaximin, which is an antibiotic and mesalamine, which is a, a typical medication we use for inflammatory bowel disease as an anti-inflammatory. Uh, both again, very interesting, not ready for prime time, but certainly something that wasn't on my radar to be looking at. Well, Salim, just like the incidence of this disease has been evolving since the early 1900s, so has the medical therapies for it. So I'm looking forward to us continuing to evolve with diverticulitis because it's not going away anytime soon. And hopefully in the next review article, we'll have some answers to the uncertainties. This is Hippo Education. <laughs>